These are my 11 rules for making more believable or realistic fantasy maps. But wait, isn't that an oxymoron? Let's talk. Hi everyone, my name is Nate and this is WASD20, a channel about tabletop role-playing games and fantasy maps. And on today's video we're going to be covering my rules for creating more believable fantasy maps. Creating worlds that will hold up to a little bit of scientific scrutiny. Now you might want to completely ignore these rules and I say you have my permission. Go ahead. I think it's totally fine. I started drawing maps, not really worrying too much about what was realistic, doing a little research here or there, but just kind of wanting to chill and draw maps and have fun. And personally, I think that's great. So keep on going if that's your thing. Because instead of the way that things have formed here on Earth, you might prefer that huge titans or ancient curses or dragon fire or magic have shaped your world to be the way that it is. But my goal for this video is to help you plan to ignore the rules of science and go with magic instead with intent, on purpose, and not be caught off guard by some of the apparent unrealistic elements of your world or your map, and then have to go back and find a magical explanation for it. Now it might not be a huge deal if you're playing D&D with some friends, although some players might find it rather immersion breaking if things are not believable. However, it's much more important if you ever think you might want to publish something with this setting that you've built, like a novel or an RPG supplement. At that point, your work will be subject to a much more public scrutiny, and it's a good idea to think some of these things through. All right, with that out of the way, let's get on with the rules, the Ten Commandments of Fantasy Map Making. The first couple tips have to do with water and specifically rivers, which are such a common place to see errors on fantasy maps. Probably one of the biggest ones is that rivers do not split as they flow. Rather, if you see a fork in a river on a map, it's usually going to be rivers joining together into a, into a larger flow. So that's one area that I commonly see on maps. Rivers generally do not split. There are exceptions to this, but it is extremely rare. One exception is with that of a delta. So what's actually happening with a delta is that you are getting a large amount of sediment or silt that is flowing down river and depositing itself near the mouth of the river. So what you're seeing is not so much the river splitting, but you're seeing the mouth of the river widen and little kind of islands of silt depositing themselves and forming there. These little land masses often kind of change with the seasons, but it's not quite the same as a river splitting. So I urge you to generally not split rivers, rather have them join together. When you see these branching paths on river, think about flowing from higher points into lower points and joining together as they make their way out to a lake or the sea. One of the things to keep in mind is that water always is going to be flowing to the lowest points that it can. It is going to take the path of least resistance and gravity is going to play a role in where that water flows. And that brings us to our second rule, which is also related, and that is that a lake is generally only going to have one river that drains it out toward another lake or the sea, perhaps. Now, there might be some cases where a lake does not have any rivers that drain it. I, I believe the Caspian Sea, for example, is only drained by evaporation. And so that's one factor where there's this kind of equilibrium that is maintained due to the water flowing in and an equal amount of water being evaporated, more or less. But when you do have a river that is draining a lake, only have one, because it is just so extremely unlikely that you're going to have two equally low points where that water is going to be going. It's just gonna pick the lowest point and go there. And the last one that I don't see too often, but I have seen a little bit, is there will be no coast to coast rivers. Say it with me now, there will be no coast to coast rivers. I mean, really what's happening there is it's not even a river at that point. If you have a coast to coast river, it's gonna be two separate land masses. That's gonna be sea there. Uh, you're not gonna see coast to coast river because water is going to start at a high point and it's going to flow to a low point. A great place to start when you're thinking about where rivers should go is starting with mountains and then giving them a path out to sea. You're gonna have probably some 
tributaries on that main river here and there, perhaps multiple kind of streams coming off of the mountain into a river that goes into a bigger river and all of that. So think about where water will gather. Snow melt is a great thing to think about in mountains. That's how I generally do it, is that if you have mountains that have a decent amount of precipitation, you're going to see some rivers coming out of that mountains, and I usually make them flowing out to sea. It can be a very meandering path, but understand that when you make the path of that river, you are deciding the low points of the land. Before we move on to the next rules, I'd like to take a moment to thank my sponsor for this video, World Anvil. One of the challenges for us world builders and game masters is keeping all of this content organized and World Anvil is the best way I've seen to do this. It is the place to go to organize your world building notes and story arcs, and the ability to link content in a wiki format gives you all the campaign and story information you need at your fingertips at any time. Whether you want to create a great looking timeline for the history of your world, upload your map and add notes and tags, or keep track of all your NPCs, World Anvil has you covered for all this and more. It's definitely worth checking out, and you can try it for free right now at worldanvil.com, or just use the link down in the video description. And now? The fourth rule is that there will be no lonely mountains. You will not draw one mountain all by itself, unless you have a very good reason, and usually that's going to be magical in nature, because naturally, mountains are going to be created by factors that will tend to create lots of mountains. A mountain range whether that's plate tectonics or volcanic activity or something else, the things that create mountains don't just create one. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. What about the lonely mountain in Middle Earth? Is something like this actually possible in the real world? Well, the answer to that is sort of, yes. Because when you get a more full picture of Middle Earth, you realize that the Lonely Mountain is actually not that lonely. You have the Grey Mountains pretty close by, the Mountains of Mirkwood, and the Iron Hills. So I guess it depends how lonely we're talking about here. And something like this technically in the real world would be possible, and it would very likely be because of volcanic activity. Volcanic activity creates mountains in a much more sporadic fashion that can create some uh, more scattered peaks here and there. So the Lonely Mountain, possible, but would probably have blown its top by this point. In the real world, if one looks at the volcano, Mount Kilimanjaro, you do notice that it, it appears fairly lonely depending on the angle of the photo, but in other photos we can notice that it does have some friends nearby which, as evident on this map, are also volcanoes. So there is something kind of romantic about a single mountain all by itself in a flat plain, and there might be a magical reason for that. For example, some titans or giants once built a great tower there and crumbled, and these are the ruins, this now mountain. That's kind of cool. I, I dig it. But if you're trying to make things believable in a natural way, then don't put one mountain all by itself. Create mountain ranges. Most of the mountain ranges on Earth tend to form north to south. We'll get to that a little bit when we get to plate tectonics. But your mountains can form a line, they can form a cluster. Either way, group your mountains together. And look at the shapes of mountain ranges on Earth when you're deciding how you want to place your own. Also related to mountains, rule number five. Consider the rain shadow effect. So in most places on Earth, you see that one side of a mountain usually is very lush and gets a lot of rain, and the other side is quite arid and does not. You can see this all over the place. In Western Washington, we had the Cascade Mountains. So on the coastal side of the Cascades, it is very wet. And on the east side of the mountains, it is quite dry comparatively. If I try to explain the science of it, I'm probably going to mess it up, but oh, what the heck, here goes. So what you generally see is that wind is blowing in one direction. There is a prevailing wind direction over a mountain range. On the side where the wind is blowing, you see a lot of moisture gathering in the air and it being released as it goes higher and higher over the mountain range on one side of the mountain range. And therefore, on the other side, as the wind descends, there's not much moisture left in that air and it's going to be therefore much drier. You see this in the Cascade Mountain Range, you see it in the Himalayas, you see it in Hawaii, and in most places you're gonna find that the coastal side, the side closest to the sea, is going to be the wet side, but not always. In South America, for example, the eastern side of the Andes Mountains is the wet side, and the coastal side, the west coast, is actually much drier. 
and that's again because of the direction of the prevailing winds. Also that east side of the Andes Mountains, yeah, that's the Amazon rainforest side. So what that means for you in your worlds is that generally you're not going to see lush forested areas on both sides of a mountain range. All right, now we're going to get into the seedy territory of plate tectonics. Rule number six is considering the shape of your land masses. Now, first off, I wanna say I get a lot of the information for this video from a book called A Magical Society Guide to Mapping. It's actually a free PDF and it's got a lot of good information. The layout and artwork leave a little something to be desired, but it serves its purpose and it is pay what you want or free, I think, on DriveThruRPG. So I will definitely put a link in the video description. Go pick it up. If you're wanting more detail or you're finding my explanations insufficient, this book probably has you covered. I should also note that sometimes when we're drawing fantasy maps, we're not drawing an entire globe. And that's usually the case with me. When I am drawing a fantasy world, I am using world in the sense that the inhabitants would use that word. The, the creatures living here would call this area their world. This is their known world, but I'm usually not drawing an entire planet or globe. And I think that's perfectly fine. Some people like to start with the big picture and build the whole world. I'm not one of those people. I generally like to start with an area, partially because I feel it makes the stories a little more up close and personal when you're not talking about an entire globe. But you do you, and if you are doing the whole globe effect, then it's really important to think about plate tectonics. How did these land masses used to fit together? If this is an older world, imagine that they used to fit together and shape your continents thusly. Think about how the land masses of Earth used to be one in Pangaea and are now broken apart, but you can still see evidence of how they used to fit together. A curious observer can just notice this by looking at a globe and saying, oh yeah, I, I can see that probably used to fit right there. So do that same thing in your world and understand that there are also tools out there for you. I mentioned one in a video a while back. You can see that this web application is really good at simulating plate tectonics for randomly generated land masses, and it's really cool. So if you're not very good at it, there are tools for you to do that, but understand you can also usually make land masses the way you want and kind of retrofit your plate tectonics and decide, okay, this is the way this used to fit here and then this used to fit here and these plates are moving this direction. And you can do that within reason with a lot of existing maps that you already have. Rule number seven, consider how plate tectonics has shaped your mountains. And this one, again, you can usually retrofit after the fact and decide where your mountains are. But generally, again, we see that mountain ranges go north to south on Earth because of the way our tectonic plates have shifted. And you often see that mountains are going to form on coastal areas. Think of the Cascades, the Appalachians, the Andes Mountains. These mountain ranges were formed by a mixture of volcanic activity at times, but also plate subduction, where one plate is going under the other. I'll show some pages from A Magical Society so you can see this illustrated a little bit better. But subduction means that one plate is going under another one as they are pushed together, and mountains are usually going to form on the one that is not subducting. Some of the Earth's biggest mountains were actually formed by one tectonic plate just smashing into another one completely, and that is India, which used to be part of Africa, breaking off and then colliding with the Eurasian tectonic plate. That collision resulted in some massive mountains. One last thing I'll say is that mountains are often formed by volcanic activity. You might get a thin part of the Earth's crust, for example, where magma or molten rock has come up and formed some islands and often mountains and volcanoes. This is the case with Hawaii. And these make for really great kind of chains of islands that are often fairly rugged and mountainous and sometimes volcanic. So there's a lot more detail we could go into on that, but again, consider how plate tectonics may have formed some of your mountain ranges. All right, our next couple rules are going to relate to settlements. Rule number eight is that settlements are generally going to be found near water. Water has traditionally been such an important part of human life or elf life or dwarf life or tiefling life. So think about where would be advantageous for life. Places that would make good ports are an important one and places that have enough water to sustain agriculture and other ways that water is necessary for life. I often make exceptions to this for dwarven settlements which are just found in the rockiest mountains possible because dwarves eat rocks or maybe there's underground rivers down there, I don't know. So putting your settlements on good port areas, which we'll get to in number nine, and on rivers and lakes and things like that 
are just going to be great places for creatures to try to build civilizations. Water, it sustains life. Certainly there are other factors, and so just consider why would people build a settlement here, in this place? And rule number nine, let's talk about port cities. Ports are generally going to be found in places that are not right on the coast, right in a very exposed area, but rather just a little bit in, like in a bay or a harbor, or an area that is sheltered from wind and rough waters. So rather than putting your port cities on these precipices or the edge of a peninsula, think about a little more sheltered area, and it could even be a little bit inland, so to speak. It could be on a river or lake near a great sea, but certainly a harbor or a little inlet is going to be a great place for a port city. Another thing to consider is that it's generally going to be very deep water, and so maybe you don't think about that too much when you're building your world, but you know, if there's a reef, it might not be the greatest spot. It's generally going to be a very deep harbor so that boats can easily move in and out without having to fear scraping the bottom. And ports are generally going to be found in places that are ice-free year-round. So if you have a very frigid area and there is a place that isn't ice-free quite nearby, that's gonna be a more likely place for a port city. If your world is a freezing wasteland, like the state of Michigan right now, then that's gonna be a little bit of a challenge. These people are still going to build ports somewhere, but if given the option, a more likely place will be ice-free year-round. Rule number 10, consider climate. Now, I'm not going to get into a whole lot of climate science here because it's really, really hard and it would just take way more time than we have, but I would recommend that in general, keeping things similar to what you notice on Earth so that very, very hot areas are not going to be right next to very, very cold areas and there's going to be some rhyme or reason that is generally gonna find polar regions being colder and getting closer towards some sort of equator getting warmer. Use common sense, and personally on my maps, I tend to kind of shrink the climate zones beyond what you would actually find on Earth, and I'm okay with that. But generally, keeping things very similar to Earth, keeping your world on a, what is it, 45 degree tilt, and uh, roughly the same size as Earth will just keep things simple and make sure that you're not getting tripped up in the climate science weeds. Anyway, on this, again, not too much science, just kind of use common sense and think about the way things are on Earth. And certainly this is one place where you could get magical with it. If you want to go uh, Lion the Witch in the Wardrobe, always winter and never Christmas, you could do that. Some kind of ancient curse that keeps one area particularly hot or cool or the presence of some magical being or artifact. Those can be fun things to play with, so go for it. And that brings me to rule number 11, Break the rules! I think I've pointed out several ways that there are exceptions to the rules here and there, and there are also ways in which magic and magical beings can play a role in shaping your world, and you don't have to get too caught up in the real-world science if you don't want to. If it's not something you enjoy and you don't see it serving a very great purpose, break the rules like crazy. Just understand that it can be immersion-breaking for some people, and if you ever hope to share this world with the public, it is going to come under some scrutiny that could cause you some pain. All right, 11 rules is where we're gonna call it quits here. There's a lot more we could say, and I would love to hear some of your rules for world building or map making down in the comments. Some of you out there have a lot more experience with this than me. I'm kind of a tourist when it comes to uh, getting into the science of world building, and I'm very new to it. Still, there are some little bits I've picked up here and there, and certainly A Magical Society was helpful as I recently read that. So hopefully you found this helpful in helping you create worlds that are more believable. Hey, if you like to draw maps as much as me, come on over to the WASD20 Discord server, where there's actually a map channel where people can share maps and get feedback. I'm posting there, other people are posting a lot of great conversations about maps, so come check us out on Discord. There's a lot of great RPG, world building, game master discussion going on there, and it's just a fun place to hang out. Before we go, I really wanna give a huge thank you to my patrons for their support of this channel. These people make these videos possible, and I am so grateful for their generous support. There's also some pretty cool rewards, and you can go check them out for yourself on patreon.com slash WASD20. One of those rewards is a quarterly encounter map at this time. Now, I'll be probably making a video about my first quarterly encounter map, which is a shipwreck in a desert oasis. What a cool idea. That was an idea one of my patrons came up with, and then all of my patrons voted on many of the ideas. We just reached 50 patrons, and when I reach 100, I'm actually gonna start making the quarterly encounter map a monthly encounter map. So I'd love to have you come aboard as the newest member of the patron army. 
All right, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you give it a like, make sure you're subscribed to keep on getting more, and everybody take care. You'll see me again very soon.